This Week in Radio Tech. Episode 156 is brought to you by Omnia Audio and the amazing Omnia 9 FM audio processor by Leif Clayson. Omnia 9 offers more features in a single audio processor than ever seen anywhere else. See if they're right for you at omniaaudio.com slash nine. And now, our feature presentation, Twerd. Every radio station department touches the engineering department in some way. How can you get more from your career by working with non-engineers? All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? Yeah, all your days are belong to us. Yeah. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Stephen Poole of Crawford Broadcasting in Birmingham joins Chris Tobin for smart insights into engineering and those other radio departments. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Ah, uh, welcome to another week of This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Chris Tobin and I'm covering for Kirk Harnack, who is uh, on location, on assignment, actually in a part of the world where he just can't get himself together with the bandwidth he needs. It's not his problem. It's the problem of where he is. He's somewhere in Auckland, New Zealand. That's all we know. Uh, we're hoping to hear from him at some point. But until then, it's just myself and our guest this evening, Stephen Poole. Uh, Tom Ray is uh, making attempts to contact us. However, he is taking care of, fa- taking care of family matters. I believe his daughter is going to a dorm uh, back to school. So we know how that can be. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let it roll and see what happens. So uh, without further ado, let's talk to Stephen Poole, who's the CE Crawford Broadcasting in Birmingham, Alabama. We'll uh, have uh, Stephen. I'm sorry? I said that's me. Uh, that's that's right. him. What we'll do is uh, first uh, talk quickly about what's in the headlines and uh, see what's happening in the world of uh, the radio business. And lots lately, I actually had a call from someone talking about uh, HD radio and asking where things would stand with that. And in a recent, I think, Radio World article, there was some talk of HD radios actually expanding. So it's interesting to see. So check out Radio World for the latest on that. Also, uh, don't forget, the latest now with the FCC is looking to try and find ways to help the AM band or AM broadcasters. We'll see. There's a commissioner who's trying to push things and make things happen. So if you find out or hear anything with AM broadcasting and FCC, read about it and have your company or radio station try and support where possible. Otherwise, AM radio broadcasting may go the way of analog television as we know it uh, and see what that got them. So... Uh, it's not going to be fun. Still viable, you know, medium is, is AM and FM. Television still works, but in, you know, in the long run, when you need to do something and focus on one item, only the only medium that works best is radio. You can listen while doing something else. So you can truly multitask with radio. Television, mm, not really. But that's okay. So that being said, let's talk with Stephen Poole. Stephen, if you would be good enough to just explain to everyone what you do, where you're from, Crawford Broadcasting, group ownership, things of that sort, and then we'll get into some uh, nitty-gritty about you know, the business itself. Sounds good. Well, of course, well, like I say, I'm the uh, market chief engineer for Crawford Broadcasting in Birmingham, Alabama. I work for the best company in radio. Uh, Don Crawford uh, is, you know, he actually runs the company. He's one of the greatest men I've ever known. My immediate supervisor, my boss, Chris Alexander, is one of the best engineers in the business and he is absolutely a ball to work with all of our stations here are hd the fms and the ams we have three fms and two ams they're all hd multicasts on the fm um it's just having a ball doing the usual engineers gig keeping us on the air keeping everything working when possible and making sure that we're on the very bleeding edge that's my job. Oh, that's I like that job. That's the kind of job I used to have. So with the with the stations doing HD, I'm curious because uh, we've got a calls a lot uh, from about that. What what do you do different to make the HD successful? Or uh, I guess yeah, I guess say successful. I mean, I know the HD one is basically the primary audio channel, and now it's in digital. Do you find it? Do you do it? You said you have multicasting, so I'm assuming it's HD two and three is also available in the FMs. Yes. Well, we're we, you know, we're trying to balance the reality that, you know, we're still uh, I mean, let's face it, there's not that many receivers out there yet. They're increasing, but we're trying to balance the costs and the amount of effort with 
what we're talking. Basically, what it is, we're compromising. We have uh, two multicasts on one of our FMs, and then we just have one multicast on the other FM. But if you're asking me where it makes the biggest difference on our main signal, on the main channel, in an area like Birmingham with a lot of hills, uh, HD is a multipath killer. It just kill. I mean, you don't have multipath. Uh, the very case, right after we first put it on air, we had an antenna burnout. Not three weeks after we went on air, and the HD was down for a couple of weeks. I was a very miserable man. I had forgotten how bad multipath can be uh, <laughs> with the HD. Seriously. Now that, uh, that's it on your main channels. Now on the secondary channels. Because they are usually lower bit rate, the biggest thing you have to watch on them is the processing. You right. you That's can't right. you can't. I mean, you already knew you can't process HD the same way. But don't think that you're just going to take the output of your Omnia that's running the analog and like hook it into someone's multicast at 32 or 48 kilobits per second because it will not sound good. It will not sound good at all. So, so on that, along those lines, I, I know exactly what you're saying because the stations I used to manage, the FMs, we had uh, HD twos and threes, and uh, at first everybody thought, oh, you just you know put an audio processor on the audio <laughs> path and that's it. And well, lo and behold, we, we all did that, and we even do it on the streams too. You know? Right, right. Well, I, I you know I was tre I tried to explain to some folks that the uh, the HD two and HD threes you should treat them, hey, HD one as well. Treat them like a stream because they technically are a stream that you're just exactly. modulating. You know, putting exactly. in, you know, uh, so I am curious uh, with your discovery of the audio processing having to be different on HD two and HD three. How did you go about finding the the, the sweet spot, or the, you know, the the best combination of technologies to make it uh, palatable for those to listen on, on HD two and three? Well, some of this is just common sense. First, make sure you have a processor try to get a processor that has a setting for digital audio and as a matter of fact if you get a processor that will do streams it's fine for HD make sure it has a preset or a setting that is geared for for streams the other thing we like to do to help get rid of some of the swishing and the grittiness in the audio another thing we like to do is just very smoothly roll off the high end just a little bit. Just, you know, I mean, we're not talking about turn the treble off, but just roll it off maybe 360 dBs above, say, 7.5 kilohertz. Just roll it off a little bit. That makes all the difference in the world. And on, on your HD 2 and 3s, are you doing a combination of music uh, and, and talk, or is it just primarily talk that's, that's heard? A sports we, uh, or something? We do have talk on uh, one of them. The other one is music. It's <laughs> we have a old fella here that has been doing southern quartet style gospel since it was invented. Wow! And, uh, that was a joke. Not much of one though. Not much of one. But uh, he has been doing it for years. But uh, a lot of his fans were just really pleased when we put his program on one of our stations HD2s and we gave it a little extra bit rate because it's music and uh, so we actually have some listeners here who bought HD radios just to hear his program believe it or not oh I believe it I, I, I many years ago I worked for a uh, worked at an AM radio station that uh, it was only a thousand watt AM station it was at 1400 kilohertz on the dial and uh, we did something a little different we were doing a full service format and you know in the days of programming full service formats it was Sort of a uh, you know hot hot AC music mixed in with news on the top of the hour, bottom of the hour sports, and peppered with weather reports every ten minutes type of thing uh, mm. as a full service format. And we also the, the program director who was uh, from Pittsburgh, KDK. Uh, he was actually an assistant PD at KDK. Got a chance as being a full time PD. Brought us in a in a conference room. Myself, uh, the engineering uh, and programming, sales, and I think it was a couple of the jocks. And sat us down and said, okay, guys, station right now has no ratings, which we did. We had zero, like 0.5 in the Arbitron. And the Arbitron diaries were only twice a year, fall and uh, spring. So you know how that can go. And he said, we're going to do something completely different. We're going to approach everything with the phrase, who cares? 
If you can say to yourself, whatever you're doing on the radio right now, people will care about it. We've got a winner. Nobody knew what the hell he was talking about. They're like, what? You know, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. He goes, no, no. We're going to break the mold. And I will tell you, for the following six years, the station went from nowhere to the number one station in the market. We beat out the 50 kilowatt FMs, two of the 50, uh, 50 kilowatt AMs that uh, easily reached the market from New York City. This was a suburb of New York that we were operating out of. And we did stuff that today, by today's standards, people would be like, uh, wow, you, you can't really do that. That's not going to work. Nobody would believe it. And it worked. I believe it. No, no. And, and I've traveled the countryside. You know, the company I, I, I work with uh, uh, at Music Cam USA, we do IP codecs, both video and audio for disclosure. And um, you know, I travel around and I get to see and talk to people now in a different way. And I still see some of the great, innovative, creative ways of doing radio. And it's just, a, it's, it's, it's great. But when you go to the major cities, uh, they get a little skittish. They, you know, they choose not to. But when you're talking about, like you say, with the, your HD2s and, you know, here's somebody playing music and it's unique and they're purchasing HD radios just to hear it. If you have content that's compelling, that's why I'll just call it that. People will go there out of their go. way. They'll, they'll go out of their way to, to find a way to listen to it. And this AM station I worked for, we would do contests and give away these goofy prizes for, you know, lunches and dinners and stuff. And it was just fun. The goal was just to have fun, make you laugh. Well, one day we got a call from somebody, and they won the contest. They, the jock, you know, the DJ took down the, the name, the whole information, and then called us, called me and said, hey, I don't know where this is, but this guy is calling. He says he listens all the time, and he won the contest, but he doesn't live in the area. I said, where does he live? He lives in Queens. I was like, yeah, it's New York City, so what? Yeah, but we're in Connecticut. He goes, how the hell is he doing this? I'm like, well, he's probably got a super radio, GE super radio, and listening to us. So he called him up. I called the guy and I said, "Hey, you know, uh, congratulations, you won. You don't live in the area. Do you mind driving up here, or do you want us to do something else?" He goes, "No, I'll come up." He goes, "No problem." So I had talked to him a bit. I said, "So what exactly do you enjoy about it?" He goes, "You guys are fun because I you make me laugh. I I'm entertained. The music's good, but it's in between the songs." Like he goes, "I enjoy it." I got so many other stations that do nothing around here. He's calling from yep. Queens, New York. Okay, and I'm like, "Wow, this was 1988, I guess it was," and I just sat there and was like. It just, you know, the light goes off when you hear that. And then today, you got people trying to reinvent the wheel, and somewhere along the line, they get lost. So to hear that you have an HD2 signal, HD3, and somebody's buying radios for the content, it, that's, that's encouraging. I can't say it's true for everybody else. It's been HD. <laughs> uh, no, I don't, what you just said, I fully agree with. By the way, let me clarify something. When I'm talking about rolling off the high end, I think I said 6 dB. That is radically too much. Really, it's more like 1 or 2 dB, and that's only on low bit rate streams. You don't do that on the high bit rates. Okay, right. just to clarify. Uh, yeah, but i got to be careful. But, you know, um, you are absolutely right. One thing the, the, about me, I, you know, whether – not just engineering. I love radio. I believe in radio. I still believe in what radio does. I believe in its mission. And you are absolutely right. You didn't realize it, but I was kind of like cheering you on just then. <laughs> because these stations, and I'm, I'm trying to be careful how I say this so that I'm, I'm being diplomatic but these stations that basically want to be 24-hour jukeboxes playing the same 30 songs over and over and over are what's killing radio. You're well, not going to yeah. get an argument from Adam, Adam, You're not going to get an argument from me on that. Well, I, I will say this. I, I was employed by a broadcasting company that was very progressive in their ways. Uh, there, it was, the company was called Chase Broadcasting in Connecticut, and we had a couple of stations People in the audience may know and remember if you're in the Northeast, uh, WTIC AM and FM in Hartford, Connecticut, and we had stations in St. Louis and Denver. But the one thing that the uh, executive staff, I'll call them, always encouraged the staff the, of the radio stations to, to uh, do is, you're a 1,001 AM station, so what? You're going to operate like a 5,001 AM station. You're right. a 3,000 um, 3, watt class A FM, you're going to operate like a 10,000 watt FM. And mm -hmm. everyone's like, what? This is what we're going to do. These are the goals. That's, we're going to set them high, and we're going to achieve them. And at the end of the day, we're going to win. And, and it's true, because I will say this. The, the, the radio station I worked for at the time made no money, had no advertising influence at whatsoever in the county. And uh, after Chase took over, within six months, we had a one share. People couldn't believe it. 
And we became the talk of the town six months because this program director took a very, by today's standards, <laughs> you know, a really wild ass approach to be frank. And it worked. And then within a year, we suddenly were starting to dictate where we'd be broadcasting from, where we would do stuff, which events we could participate in and make sense of. And it was wild. And today I, I, I go to these programming seminars and try to meet up with folks outside the engineering world just to better grasp where uh, the edit, I, like I call it, the editorial side of the business and how technology can help it. Because I've always believed that technology should be quiet. You shouldn't be impairing the editorial folks, whether it be sports news or even music, and just make it happen. And it's just wild. Some of the stuff people say you can't do. It just doesn't work. I'm sitting there going, well, what you just said doesn't work. We did at a radio station and successfully made money at it. And people remembered us. And I was like, wow. Some, and you're right. People today, I don't think, get it. They're just not paying attention. And the jukebox approach, I've always said this. And I have friends of mine for many years that laugh because they've gone to uh, who are, friends of mine who are program directors. So I have a lot of folks who are not just engineering types. And I told them, I said, the problem we have in this industry, and many other industries do the same thing, the phrase, less talk, more music, had to be the worst thing any consultant or any programmer could have ever come up with. And then people say, well, no, that's, that's good. I said, no, it's not. Because what you've done is subconsciously, and this is what they call subliminal advertising, you have sub subconsciously told people that whenever you hear something talking, that's bad. Tune out. Absolutely right. And think about it. The, the next time you're in a car and you're driving around with folks who are not in the industry and you have a music station on or maybe even a, a talk station and you know, suddenly they, 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 you know, something changes, watch how fast they change the dial setting. You watch. And that's the problem. And back in the 80s and, and then early 90s, it was, you know, less talk, more music, and it just, it just destroyed everything. And the jukebox, jukebox approach, you're definitely right doesn't work anymore. I don't care what anybody says, you can be any programmer in the world, doesn't work. People can find their own way of doing music. Uh, let's see, what's the latest that's been going on? Oh yeah, the Harlem Shuffle, right? Is that the, uh, the latest craze? The Harlem Shuffle is from a musician, I'll, I'll be that kind, and it's, it's proper, from a musician, no name, no history, nothing, no record label, and sure. has made it big, top, top of the charts, and now I believe Billboard is now looking at YouTube to start looking for chart toppers. Okay? Right. So what does that say? That you can't just do jukebox. It's not going to work. And I don't know what, when it's going to happen, when it's going to hit people, but you just can't keep forcing it. It's not going to happen. So, no. But no matter what we say, it's not going to change the way of the world and the, the industry itself. So I guess we'll just move along onto other more technical things that people might enjoy. Or maybe hey, not. But we are permitted. <laughs> We're permitted. Well, we are permitted, and here's why. I, will, I, will, I'll, I'll, I just uh, a couple of weeks ago had an opportunity to speak before some students at a local university uh, in their broadcast program, and it was fun. I actually enjoyed doing it because it's it's kind of thing that sort of like giving back. But I, um, I spoke to them, and they they said, "Well, why you know well, why do you care about sales and programming and this and that outside the technical realm?" And I told them, I said, "Well, if you're going to do anything in any business." And we'll stick to broadcasting for now. So you're an engineer for a radio station. You're an assistant engineer or you're director of engineering, VP, whatever it is. Your job is not only to find the technology that makes the station run, we'll use in simplest terms, but your job is to help extend and find a way to bring to life what the programming department, whether it be sports, news, or music, is trying to accomplish, which, is I the, agree. which at the end of the day is yeah. generating revenue. Let's not, you know, let's not be silly. At the end of the day, it's about making money. The question is, how do you approach that, and how do you do it so that you make the money and repeat it every day without feeling uh, it's like a mundane process or feel like you're on an assembly line? And, and I explained to the students, I said, you know, you have to understand how a salesperson thinks. There's nothing wrong with the salesperson in general. Yes, they have a certain stereotype, but it's the nature of the beast. You're asking somebody to go to someone else and ask for money. You're asking them to buy into something that's basically broadcast on the radio. It's not tangible per se. What's tangible is the results you get from people responding to that intangible item, which is the airwaves. So now what happens? You have a person who's trying to sell people on things. They're going to say things and do stuff that's somewhat we may consider not normal for you know people in normal conversation. But if you understand where they're coming from, then you can appreciate some of the goofiness they do, and you work with them. I have a story of I had a sales manager who used to walk past my office every day. I'd say hello. He'd, he'd nod and continue on his way. <laughs> then one day, 
one day he shows up on my doorstep, on uh, the door frame that is, and says, I have a question. I, I can, uh, can, you know, how's it going today? What's going on? I'm looking, I'm like, oh, today's going very well. It's been a good day. We've had this and that. And I told him a few things about the transmitter site and some issues we had with a couple of automation systems. And he's like, oh, that's great. You know, I'm, you know you're really on top of things. So I stop him <laughs> midstream. I said, all right, what is it you want? I said, what do you, what do you want from me? <laughs> and he looks at me, he's like, what? Uh, well, I can't just I ask. Uh, I said, you can certainly ask. However, you walk past the office every day at 9.06, and you, you sort of nod your head to acknowledge I'm in the window, sort of like uh, I feel like I'm in a pet shop or something, you know, on display, and you never do anything else. Now you've come to my, my office, you ask about my day, how are things going, blah, 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 and all of a sudden you are offended that I ask you, what are you here for? It turns out he was looking for information on our coverage map of the signal for the FM station, and he was trying to understand better how to get a car dealership involved and they said they can't hear the station and you know rightfully so where they were located they're not going to but i did tell them i tried to explain to them i said well you can talk to them in this vein they can advertise and do this and do that on the main signal we also have the website and they can reinforce their message through the website but the, the fact is the audience they're serving is in our coverage area so they're not losing out what they need to do is encourage people to come down so what we should consider is maybe a live broadcast tied into a local community event and boom they look like the heroes he looks at me like you're the engineer for the station I was like, yeah, why? You just talked to me about a sales pitch. I was like, right. But I'm using the technology that we have to make it happen. I'm trying to tell you, if you want to do it, we have it. We can do a remote. You know, we can do an RPU, Marty device. Everybody remembers the Marty units. Or you could oh, yeah. use a POTS codec or an ISDN. And but because I was able to talk to him on his level, this is where I'm getting, I'm going to, is he then, he then has respect. More respect and not the stereotype, oh, that's the guy with the pocket protector plaid shirt in the back office. You know, don't talk to him. And all of a sudden, now he, you know, when he stopped by, he walked past the office, he stopped in and said, hi, how's it going? And when he had a question, he would actually talk to you in a very, how would you say, intelligent business-like and not a condescending looking down at you or, you know, oh, it's the engineer again, we've got to talk to him. Oh, I don't believe this. That's what I was getting at with the students. And they looked at me like, really? That, that's what you do? I said, yeah. If you could go to your general manager, the owner of the facility, I'm sure you have on many occasions had to talk to the owner, and you say, you know, he says, look, I have no idea how we do this transmitter thing or the studio thing. All I know is two of the jocks keep complaining about X, Y, and Z. What do we got to do? You have two choices as the engineer when you're talking to the owner about the money. You could say, well, look, you can spend $20,000 and do this, or you can spend $20,000 and get this, 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 and this as a result, and now you can expand on this, and we can actually go to places the sales department might be able to tie in, and we can make, 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 make back the money and do other things. Which yep. do you think, which of those two scenarios do you think the GM is willing to listen to you with? All right. No, I agree. So, you know, um, so I, I, it's, it's been interesting and fun watching how some people interpret what to do. And when you read the trades, it's like, wow, wow, people are just missing the boat. So, you know, from what you're saying with the HD content, loving radio and being passionate about it is no different than somebody who's, say, a, a friend of mine who, um, actually a friend of my wife's, she her, <laughs> she uh, splits jeans. You know, she does DNA work, and she loves it. She's passionate about it to the point where she actually has done a, a thesis and a, a doctorate or something, and it's actually being published. You know, it's the equivalent of, say, doing a patent. Good for her. Exactly. But, you know, some people think of it as like a you know, lab rat because she wears a coat, lab coat and works on things in this big, funny-looking electronic microscope. But she's passionate about it, and she gets results. And that's what I think is missing with some of our you know, brethren here in the radio industry. It's like, guys, you can be passionate about it. You can be an engineer. No one says you have to wear a pocket protector. I mean, you know, not really. You know, really, you don't probably shouldn't. But you know, <laughs> dress, dress, you know, dress accordingly. You know, if you're gonna go to a meeting with folks in the, in the radio station, don't dress in jeans and a torn shirt or something that looks like you just came out of the garage. You know, be presentable. You know, spiffy business. I think they call it spiffy casual. Um, I did that a lot. I learned a lot from my early days working with some folks that just weren't interested in uh, socializing with the rest of the radio station. I was like, I'm not gonna go very far if I continue this path. And when I changed my appearance, it uh, made a difference. And I think I think that's something to take away from what you're talking about. Do you, do you experience that at you know at your facility when you're working with others within the business, you know, within the in, in your radio station group? Uh, well, you, sure. You notice and, a difference of people. Yeah. Well, and this is probably one of the most overused terms everywhere now, not just in radio, but the idea of being on a team. I do uh -huh. feel like I'm on a team. They, uh, whenever someone here makes a nice sale, 
uh, makes a, you know, signs a really nice contract, they'll send out an email and I always try to add my congratulations to that to let them know that I am part of it and I appreciate what they're doing. I think uh, you do have to, uh, I think you do have to be part of the team if we can use the word that way. And listen to. I agree. All right, cool. So let's let's talk about some more specific stuff. So at Crawford Broadcasting, uh, do you have? Uh, is it just yourself at the radio station? Do you have uh, assistants or uh, well, others that you? I have two of the best assistants in radio: a fellow named Todd Dixon and another fellow named Jimmy Parker. Two of the best assistants a man could ask for. It just we all we all have you know are prone to do anything at any time as far as work, but Todd generally tends to lean toward our computer issues. He's my computer geek. And then Jimmy has, has turned out to be the guy who runs to the transmitter sites and keeps an eye on things. And then I pitch in as needed. And of course, do all the paperwork and things like that. But yeah, I have two, two great assistants. So two good. Oh, excellent! That's 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 hard to come by. I, I I had the pleasure a couple of times in my career to have some very good people to work with and learned a lot from them. Um, I always I was I was always accused of being too um, how is it uh, too willy nilly or too too willing to just uh, be easygoing about stuff. But I tell you, I I learned a lot, and the folks that worked with me realized that I empowered them to to get the job accomplished. They knew what the goals were, and they just simply did what they had to do. And they knew that if they made a mistake. And it was an honest mistake. I'd back them up if they made a mistake. That- let me let me share this one with you, because this is a uh, true story. My my brother came up in the food business. Uh, he's doing sales now, but he came up in the believe it or not, the food industry, food service, restaurants. And he says he was in a fast food one day, and there was this guy working behind the counter. Lunchtime, they're all busy. Guy working behind the counter. And he accidentally drops a hamburger on the floor. Manager chews him out. Says, don't you know that's money out of my pocket? So the guy says, I'm sorry. They go on a few minutes later. It's crazy. He drops something else on the floor. The manager starts chewing on him again. And he's manager says, look, if you keep this up, I'm going to have to fire you. Right in front of the customers, too, which already shows you he, he had great class. Well, sure enough, my brother said within a few minutes he dropped something else. This time, the employee looked around, made sure nobody was watching, picked up that hamburger, and put it back in the rack. And what you take away from that, and I always tell that story to my guys when I tell them this, I say, as long as it's an honest mistake, we'll figure out how to fix it. But always admit it to me. Because if you're not careful what's going to happen, somebody's going to go in a control room and is going to spill some soda in your console and they're going to very quickly try to wipe it up and not tell anyone. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And you see, I mean, I know sometimes you do have to, you know, sometimes you have to take the firm hand, but I agree with you on that. Tell them if it's an honest mistake, if you know, you didn't mean to do it, you just, your hand slipped or something like that, whatever, we'll just fix it. We'll just fix it. But as long as you come clean with me, we'll be fine. Yeah, so that, agree, that's man, absolutely true. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of uh, a lot of businesses. But uh, I know in broadcasting, it's even more. We're a more intimate group than I think other industries uh, tend to be. Uh, but I, I've worked in newsrooms all my life, and uh, I can say that when you first start in a newsroom, you are not well accepted until the first big event takes place, and you show your colors. You know, you, you show you got the chops to do it. And uh, it's it's interesting where other industries, it's not always the same way. It's basically you come in, you got a set of credentials. Okay, you're expected, fine, move, you go here, do this and that. But in broadcasting, it's more than just having the credentials. It's like, like okay, let's see if you can really cut the muster. And if you can, great. And then you, you're accepted, like a fraternity. But it's uh, but you're right. If you do make a mistake, it best be honest. Otherwise, uh, you'll be doomed for life. <laughs> it just does, it won't fly. So, But before we go on, I just I need to make it. We have to stop momentarily not stop per se but you know take a break this is where our sponsor makes it possible for us to be here this evening uh, for many of you and some of you may be viewing this on a download so it might be during the day or, or an afternoon and this is where our sponsor uh, omnia audio the omnia 9 takes place omnia. so 
those of you who are not familiar with audio processing or the industry in, around it, the Omnia audio processor, uh, the Omnia 9, that is, especially, is a box that is, is genius thinking. And it was created by Leif Clayson, who I had the opportunity to meet at the NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters Convention, uh, last year and the year before. Genius, brilliant, uh, passionate, as we spoke earlier about being passionate about something. And we were talking about the processing and the approach and what he thinks is the best way and how it should work for FM and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, well, that's an interesting take on it. And he, he discovered a lot of these things by playing with sound cards from PCs. So the Omnia 9, the Omnia Audio 9 processor is more than just plug it in, turn it on, set a preset and walk away, which by rights, no processor should be treated that way. But the Omnia 9 especially is, is an approach that guaranteed if you try it, if you get a demonstration model, if they do that with your distributor you have, you whatever, you try it out. First thing you do is don't turn the knobs to 10. Don't turn them to 11. Take a preset and then back down on the stuff. And when you do that, you're going to hear things that you just never thought were possible on an FM signal with an Omnia 9. Trust me, I've done it. It's fun. It's cool. Uh, and I spoke with, uh, with Leif and, and, and he was just like, or is it Leif or Leif Clayson? And he says, yeah, you have to sort of understand you don't want to go in full bore you know running the run the charge you got to sort of back off and just take a slow approach and once you've done that the omnia 9 just sweetly sings away whether it's for music and voice and if you do it with voice the box can really bring out the brilliance of a sound of the vo of the person whether it be male or female and again it has the controls the thinking the you know the, the presets have the ability for you to say oh you know i don't know if i want that much high frequencies because that particular music is really bright because it's a powerful, uh, you know, uh, string instruments or maybe it's percussion, a lot, lots of highs. So you sort of find a way to bring it down, but still keep it within the realm of what the artist wanted. And then at the end of the day, you still have yourself a nice, loud, present, brilliant sounding station. Now, when I say loud, I don't mean screaming loud, you know, uh, for those of us in the techno world, a flat line on the oscilloscope. I'm talking about... Um, above the, I would like to say above the average sound of the uh, in a car with the windows open, okay, loud enough that you can have the car windows open on a nice summer day, hear your favorite tunes, and the Omnia Nine just blasts away, and you are unaware of the fact that the audio has been processed, brought to a le higher level, sort of bringing out what the artist wants, and doesn't uh, uh, offend anybody. Have it's, Stephen? Have you? Do you have any Omnia Nines that you use, or you have Omnia products? I'm assuming for audio processing. Oh yes. Oh, yes. I'm trying to remember what numbers we do have. I don't right. have to look at our inventory. Well, you know what? Aside from the number, we'll just... Omnia 9 definitely is, a, a, is, um, is part of the Omnia family of processing, but it takes a, a slightly different approach. So, so think of it like the you, know, you have the express train, you have a local train, the tracks go side by side, both are the same railroad themselves, but slightly different performance or expectations. Omnia 9 expectations are something, if you want to be a little creative... And try something different. Go for it. You know, yeah. There's the Omnia 10. There's the other stuff. It's like, woo. Omnia 9 is definitely something you got to try out. Now, with your experience with the Omnia products, have you found that you can go very aggressive and get a little too grungy, or have you found that if you go the other way, it tends to be a little more, uh, more dynamic, not dynamic, but more open and really excites the the oral senses of the body. Oh, uh, well, first, I just want to establish for the record that real men, real men use stay levels. <laughs> you need to know that. <laughs> stay level. Preferably with a volume axe and drive it into the red. Now, that's radio. This is true. This is true. But, yes, uh, the, the thing about a really good processor, and the Omnias are good processors, they can make you sound absolutely delicious. They can also, if you push them too hard or you push them too far, they can make you sound bad. The key is the interface and how easy it is to adjust. And I have to give, that is one thing I like about the Omnia, that, you know, the, it seems to be very logically laid out. You know, where the, like, if you decide, I'm going to try tweaking and adding a little bit of bass here, taking out a little bit of the mid-range here, it's real easy to do that. Oh, and, absolutely. And, and, of course, the ability to save and restore all the presets, which I realize all of them have that now, all the digital ones. But still, that it's just, they're very easy to adjust. I love them. Well, you have to, you know, bear in mind, uh, one thing, I have to make a correction. I said Omnia 10, I meant Omnia 11. 
not dead. Um, I, that was something else I was thinking about. But, I was wondering about that. But yeah, I, you're absolutely yeah, right. I, 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 I'm I, terrible with model numbers. I'll well, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to do the right thing. I took some notes and I incorrectly put a, a zero in place of a one. But uh, So the Omnia 11 and there's an Omnia 9. So we're talking Omnia 9 on OmniaAudio.com. Uh, Check it out. Uh, contact your favorite distributor to uh, get a demo if that's what they do. If not, uh, you know, work something out. Well worth a try. And if you do demo it, be serious about it. Be very serious and uh, make the time to do the settings correctly. Just as Stephen pointed out, you have presets. You can do, you know, you can get aggressive, get less aggressive. And don't worry if you think you're being less aggressive, not getting the job done. The well, box you know, will do it. I did, uh, I did the processing course for the SBE's online university. And the way that we described it in there, the key with any really good processor is, first of all, if it's easy to use, and the Omnias are easy to adjust, uh, what you do is you make a few very minor changes. You just push this up a little, pull that down a little, pick a preset that you like, and then just tweak it a little bit, and then sleep on it. Go 24 hours. And, uh, you know, listen to a bunch of different program material, then try another little tweak. Yeah, that absolutely. Kind of thing. It takes some patience. It does if take you think patience. you're going to sit down with a high-powered processor and make it sound absolutely delicious in 15 minutes, you are deluding yourself. That's not <laughs> going to happen. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's true. Uh, one thing to remind, remind everyone, uh, when it comes to audio processing and audio chains, uh, the audio systems uh, at your radio stations, Bear in mind the philosophy of, you know, the old phrase, garbage in, garbage out. No matter yep. what you have, if you're putting in a, in Leif, uh, I should be saying, it's Leif Clayson, and I, we spoke about this at NAB, because his one, one concern was that people don't pay attention to what's going into the box and expect something really bad to go in and still come out good. Now, granted, there are some examples that he had shown me that some audio that's super processed from record labels that are just, you know, ridiculous. And his approach and his algorithms do clean it up, but that is not the regular way to go about it. And also remember, listener fatigue still exists in the digital domain. You may not hear it as well, but it's out there. So check your audio systems, make sure the audio chain is good and, and responsive, and then have at it with the Omnia 9, and you will be pleasantly surprised. Well worth well, the investment, well worth the investment in time and money I'll, and the revenue you'll come out that'll come out of it. But now, Chris... Uh, don't forget, if you're using the stay level in the volume acts, it's really a lot easier because then it's anything in garbage out. This is true. Those of you in the audience it, who it are... It the headaches. All the variables are gone. <laughs> Those of you in the audience who, uh, who uh, uh, do not recognize the names of volume Max or uh, automax or stay level oh, or level devil... Okay. Uh, these are these were old, and when I'm th saying stay level, and actually the old RCA limiter, the Fairchilds, Chris, you know what's amazing? These old tube limiters are collector's items now. Yes, they are. And I've thrown them away. I imagine you have too. I mean, uh -huh. you know, like years ago, we finally got our first decent processor, and could not wait to throw that stupid stay level into the trash. Oh yeah. We had held on to it. We could retire now and go on a vacation. No, yeah, absolutely. With, sell that for. But you know what? The one thing I have to say, and I, I, I explained this at a, another one of these student uh, sessions I did for engineering, where we weren't talking the editorial, but we we're actually talking engineering audio. And I mentioned to folks that you have to realize that a lot of the stuff we do now in the audio realm, and the Omnia is included in this, is that the, the Volume Max and Automax technologies. Yes, they were dated. Yes, they were, you know, an old thing, and we just hated it at times. But the folks that were behind it, Emil Turk of CBS Labs at the time, they developed the, I'll call them algorithms, but the way the box performed, the way the audio was handled, is what today people like Fraunhofer and others use as models for MPEG and for AAC. And these are things you can, you, you can read about. But think about that. Back in the 1960s and 70s, they're talking about perceptual audio uh, uh, coding but in the analog domain. And that's what those boxes were designed around. And it's just... You know, Psycho yeah. Psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics. I'm sorry, yes. Psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics. But, uh, but, you know, when you, t and you fast forward to today, and, you know, between the Omnia 9 and the Omnia 11, you can, you can do a lot now because the technology lets you do it. Whereas back then, you're pretty much locked into a particular way and that was it. 
why we had a disdain for those boxes. So, yeah, but well, no, and you want to know what's really sad? If I had one of those old tube limiters, I would sell it to them and I would take the money happily. And then I'm afraid I would be laughing at them behind their back as they walked away with it. Because, I mean, I love how they're actually, it's a shame Kirk couldn't be here because he could back me up on this. I'm sure there are probably studios up in Nashville that probably advertise the fact that they have some of these old tube limiters. They weren't too bad, for example, to ride level on a single instrument or on a voice. But if you think you are going to run the full music mix into those things, it's going to sound like doo-doo. Right. I mean, they sound awful. But these people are paying ten and twenty thousand dollars for them. Yeah. And they're proud of it. Absolutely. Well, you know, if you go to you know, um, just to wrap up the our sponsorship with Omnia Nine, just remember, write down omniaaudio.com forward slash nine. Check it out. Uh, you're gonna like what you see. And from there, just it's you know, your imagination is your limitation. That's what I'm gonna say. So I'm gonna close with that. So Omnia Nine is the the, the thing to look at. Definitely check it out. The process it does exactly as advertised, and the folks behind it, Leaf Clayson and the others that help develop it, make it happen. Just it's genius, and you're gonna love it. Um, so just use your imagination and go wild. So omniaudio.com forward slash nine. So speaking of when you were saying you know Nashville and folks using it for single instruments, whether Volume Max, Automax, and stuff, what about the Yuri LA threes? Oh yeah. How many well, studios man. still have those, and people will die for that? Matter of fact, there are plugins. Computer workstation yep. plugins yep. for those. How cool is that? The 1176, the LA3s. Yep. I mean, who would have thought? Well, it's it is a it's a special sound. Is what you get used to. That's like actually, if you listen, the standard Nashville guitar sound is extremely compressed. It's real smacky, real compressed. Right. I guess if you or I were to really critique it on the basis of audio processing, we'd say, wow, you know, that's <laughs> the release time on that thing is about one billionth of a second. You know, <laughs> why don't you slow it down and smooth it out a little But They're going for that sound. Well, so this, to me, the same with the, uh, some of these older limiters, if you were looking for a particular sound, you know, Billy Gibbons will not discuss, uh, as people ask him how he gets his sounds, he won't tell you. He'll say, that's my secret. But there have been rumors for years that in the early days, the way he got his sound was with a tube. I think it was either Uri I or what was the other one? Started with the letter T. But anyway, it was one oh, of those yeah. tube limiters, and he overdrove it. And that's how he got his sound, like on LaGrange and all of those other early ZZ Top sound, songs. Well, you know, I had um, LA3s I used in production studios, and I did some on-air work with them. And I dissected it, and I found it was interesting. Prior to me learning what the LA3 was about, in my youthful days of experimenting with broadcast equipment and doing stuff, I actually came up with a way of compressing audio using a light bulb and a, yep. CD, and a CDS cell, or electric eye, yep. some people used to remember them. So I did this thing, and it actually did the tape outputs of a, a stereo tuner. And I, you, know, you increase the volume, and the, the tape output would uh, light the bulb, and the CDS cell would reduce it. <laughs> And I created a compressor using my stereo tuner so I could do some FM transmission. I thought it was pretty novel. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Then and later and, you know, later on, I, I take apart an LA3 URI and I look at the module, the opto module. And what is it? <laughs> it's a, it's a um, what is it, fluorescent, what do they call it? Iridescent uh, patch, you know, a square patch, a green square patch, um, and, and a, a CDS cell. Yep. So I was like, wow. So I started doing experiments with the uh, with an oscilloscope to see what, what it looked like and why did this thing sound the way it did when you, as you point out, you, you turn it all the way up and get it really grungy, but it still sounded, it had an artistic sound to it. We'll call it that. It was grungy, but had an artistic, artistic sound. And it was just the way the light bulb, the, uh, the light bulb you know, intensity, as it, it got brighter or less bright or dim, it wasn't a sharp on and off or a cliff. It was just a slow, gradual right. increase and decrease. And that's where you got the effect. Because if you went further, you know, there were people who made processors later on uh, that used LEDs in a CDS cell, or the, what's known as the LDR. And it just didn't have the same effect. And if you look at it on a scope, you're like, wow, it's like a sharp cut off and turn on. But when you looked at the LA3 or the 1176, you're saying, wow, what the heck is different here? And, and it sounded, the, audit, the, uh, the audible differences were apparent. 
And yeah, I think that that's that's that. the passion in me when I've done audio for, st for stations and people look at me like I'm nuts when they've come up with some settings. They're like, that really does work. I said, yeah. And so loud. Are you sure we're legal? I'm like, absolutely. I had several visits from the FCC on many occasions claiming that they received complaints from my competition that we were overmodulating. And you know the FCC, they show up beef. They show up after they've made their measurements, so it's not like as if you have a chance to do anything. Yeah. And uh, we 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 clean we pass with a clean bill of health every time. And uh, you know that's yeah, if you do it right, you can have some good stuff. And nowadays with the digital stuff, it's even faster. You can really get crazy and, and do stuff and have fun. Well, what's so amazing about the digital stuff is uh, they have taken multiband to just almost crazy levels. I mean, they can. Well, they're just, you know, with modern microprocessors, with the uh, digital audio processing, with all that stuff, they can take that signal breaking up into individual frequencies, individual frequency bands, analyze it, and then just do exactly what sounds the best on it. Which, by the way, that Omnia 9 does do an excellent job of doing that. Oh, way. it does. But uh, takes takes all of that, even anticipates. In fact, you want to know one big difference, and this is something anyone can hear. When you're listening, driving around listening to stations, think of a song that you remember from like the 70s or the 80s. Just off the top of my head, one like, um, oh, good heavens, I just drew a blank. But a song that starts off, for example, with like a guitar, and then when the kick drum comes in, and you'll hear the volume start dropping. On most modern processes, if you listen to them, those things are so smart, and they can anticipate what's going on. You will actually hear the volume drop just a pinch before that drum starts. I mean, they're actually anticipating what's coming. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had Mike DeRoe as a guest uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the evolution of audio processing, the approach... And some of the things that he did and explained, and you know, as we all know, Mike DeRose started off with the multiband processing. And, you know, yep. I guess you could honestly say he was the guy that started the craze of multiband processing, and just you know, things went from there. Uh, but it's just fascinating the stuff he talked about and some of the production and studio work that was done, and how they went about things. Just like you're pointing out, and it comes right back to what you said earlier in the in the show. It's the passion you have for what it is you do. You know, whether you're a software developer or a broadcast engineer or you're a transmitter RF guy, and you know, I mean, I've worked on a lot of RF stuff and I've done some really crazy black magic stuff because we all know RF is just black magic, whether it's a cell phone or an AM or FM transmitter. <laughs> you know, there's, there's the laws of physics can, can be applied. You can, you can bend them, but if you try to break them, it hurts. And those RF burns do hurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's like when I was showing, uh, the inside of a FM transmitter to my assistants not long after they went to work for me. I said, now, believe it or not, this little swinging bar here takes the 30,000 watts off that tube and puts it in the antenna. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. And I said, and they said, well, how does it do that? And I go, witchcraft. <laughs> oh, it's so true. It's, it's so true. magic. It is. Well, we, we've, we're uh, beginning to run out of time. We're down to our uh, last few minutes. Uh, we try to keep the show to some cohesive uh, you know, a moment in time, about an hour. So um, before we wrap up, I had a question for you, and that I sort of asked earlier, but I, I'm going to have to do it now. Go Looking to the future of broadcast, both AM, FM, TV, um, do, you, do you see the skill sets changing? You mentioned one of your assistants is sort of the IT guy, Another guy is sort of RF. Do the two blend over? Does your RF guy have enough IT understanding to do things, and, and or is it really delineated between the two you know, disciplines? Oh yeah. In fact, uh, to some of our older viewers, listeners, whatever you want to call them, um, you better get some IT under your belt. You better learn how streaming works. You better learn how to hook up a network. If you don't know how to do that. Uh, or you're not going to have a job within three or four years. I mean, you're just, you're not going to have a job because that's where we're all going. And in fact, this may not touch directly on your question, but thinking about, I just did an article not long ago for, uh, it was a special uh, publication that Radio World did, and it was on transmitter efficiency. Very interesting. I actually enjoyed doing that article 
And the truth of the matter is sometimes you will hear old timers talk about, oh, I remember the days when we had the Gates BC-1G and they were bulletproof. Yes, and they sounded like Dookie. And the tubes were expensive. And they ate electrical power like a pig. But whereas you look at the new transmitters, they use a lot less power. They're more efficient. They sound better. They're cleaner and they're more reliable. So... I don't know. Where am I going with this? You've got to stay change with the on. times. You've got to change with the times. You've also got to read constantly. You've got to stay on top of what's new and what's coming. You've got to be agile. This you is know. true. You've got to be flexible. Well, you know, speaking along those lines of uh, you know being flexible and agile and, and keeping up the times, I remember years ago talking with someone about FM exciters. And uh, I was trying out some new exciter. I forget which brand it was. I don't know if it was BE. Somebody was doing direct FM. And they said, well, you know, this is just not as good as the old Continental or, or it was the RCA, I think, at the time. And I said, well, actually, I think it's better. And they said, why? I said, well, those other exciters you mentioned, they do pre-distortion in, uh, in the modulator section mm -hmm. to sort of flatten out the, the anomalies and the design and the way it works. And they all looked at me like, what? I said, yeah, you may want to look into that. I said, I think that's why I'm actually getting better results with this new exciter. And, you know, I'm still using a tube transmitter, mind you. It was a, it was a FM, yeah. FM 5H Gates slash Harris and a tube final. But they were like, yeah, but no, no, this is better. This is a much better design, a better box. It's, they were familiar with it. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, at. that's what it is. They it's were familiar with it. And I was like, okay, I understand. I grew up on those 802As and, and the RCAs that were uh, turned later become a different name. You know, they, all the models that everybody did. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, it's like the early days of Excited where the PLL would unlock when you had a heavy bass note. Remember those days? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. That's when PLLs were coming into play and people were like, yes. oh, this phase lock loop thing is definitely good, but. You know, I can make it fall apart when I play this particular song from Aerosmith. Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, remember it well. Yeah, so you know, you're right. It's um, you know, if there's if any if there's a takeaway from this evening from the from this uh, from this broadcast or netcast, uh, I would say those of us both young and old or in between or just young at heart, whatever you want to call it, continue to be relevant, stay current, read, understand, ask questions, be willing to listen. Uh, I know I've been I, I, I've been accused of listening too much not saying enough but the reality is you need to listen before you make any real uh decisions and and answer people and you know get involved with those who are less understanding you know if you have somebody on staff who's interested in something in technology but you're afraid they just don't have enough chutzpah for it because they just didn't have the same background or growing up with the information you did throw that out bring them in show them People, are, you know, people can absorb information. It just gotta, it's how you approach it. Because I, I can tell you, I have some friends who I can't let them near the RF stuff because they definitely get hurt. But there are some other things they can do that are just, just brilliant. I'm like, okay, we'll get you into the RF side eventually. But right now, your other talents are really worth having. And I learned a lot from that. I mean, I have a friend of mine, you give him a, a device and he can reverse engineer it within two days and be there with a schematic. And you're like, whoa, how'd you do that? But you put him in a room with people for a party and... Yeah, that stereotype comes right out. <laughs> so, you know, be relevant, learn to understand, be understanding, and, and uh, you know, you'll be surprised what you can find. It sounds like you have two excellent assistants that, that you know, that make your day much easier. I'm a great company. I have great assistants. I'm a very happy and very blessed man. Excellent, excellent. All right, then. I think we're going to wrap things up here in this week in Radio Tech. Uh, reminded everybody, our guest this, uh, today was uh, Stephen Poole, CE, uh, Chief Engineer, uh, Crawford Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, very good broadcast company. Those of us who are in the business know darn well they're a good company. You read the articles and the success stories. So I'm going to add that in from my personal uh, aside. And also our sponsor for for today's broadcast, Omnia Audio, Omnia 9. Omnia! Omnia, that's it. Shout it out loud. Open the windows in your house and shout it out. And uh, you know, you're know you not going to take it anymore. Omnia is the only way to go. Uh, and remember, Leif Clayson who created the Omnia 9, took a different approach. So you need to take a different approach in your market, create a signature, and you know knock the pants off the competition because at the end of the day, it's about generating revenue. The real cool thing is, if you do it with some fun, then you really have a good time. Trust me, it works, it happens, that's the way to do it. So, as your host this evening, Chris Tobin saying good night, be well, 
And this week in radiotech.com, you can find out more. And the GFQ Network, where we have our host distribution, you can find out all the back shows. We'll have uh, this one posted sometime soon, and you can get to play it back, download it on your you know, personal player. Oh, that's right. It's no longer a radio only now, isn't it? So, again, things have changed. The times are changing. So, Steve, you have anything you'd like to say before we uh, go dark for the night? Not at all. I just say ta ta. I want to thank you very much for making the time. Uh, are you doing hey, it from George, you're doing it from the station? Is that where you are? Yes. Okay. I'm in studio. studio. I'm in Studio S5. Oh. I'm wow. In studio S5. Behind me is Control Room G5. Oh my goodness. A lot of do you have acronyms for different operations within the facility? Yes. We have five <laughs> stations here. Excellent. No, it's it's really good. Hey, I just curious, is there a newscaster? I know, I, I believe he's worked for a different company. Uh, James Faraday in that market still? Does that sound familiar? That does not ring a bell. Man. Ah, okay, maybe he's no longer on the air. Okay. No, it was a friend of mine I used to work with many, many, many years ago. And he uh, moved, he and his wife moved to Birmingham. And, I, and he was doing news. And I was, I forget which operation he was with. I, don't, I know it wasn't Crawford, but it was another broadcast group in, the, in town. So I was just curious if he was still on the radio. He may not be. All right, that's fine. Alrighty then, so I guess we'll wrap things up. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to download for a later posterity. Uh, you may have missed something. Check it out. And remember, sponsor, Audio Omnia Audio 9. That's all you need to know. After that, contact your distributor. If they don't know, get rid of them. Get somebody else. All right, all. Good night. Be well. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort is propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you like today's show, Tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnex wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lopez Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs>